So like the more interactions that I have because of and regarding AI, the more people point out the fact that they reach out to me and talk to me and watch my channel and all of that very specifically, like it's all the time because they say that I have a unique mindset and opinions when it comes to AI overall. So first of all, thank you for that. That's, um, I mean, I, I, I agree <laughs> overall. It's kind of like, uh, I can't say it more simplistically than that. Um, but diving into why um, I view these things and how I view these things, I can do that for you very simplistically. And then so to me, there's a few elements that come into shaping my viewpoints overall with regards towards AI. Um, and like rule number one to me is very simplistic. It's a very simple rule, which is that no matter what happens within the systems and no matter what I am observing or what I don't understand about them, that there's a physics process that is going on. And, and then so uh, that like is my attention mechanism when it comes to AI research, right? Like no matter what I know, uh, it's driven by physics. Like, um, are the models actually looking at data or re abstract representations of data? Like, to me, it's when you look at the physics, they're dealing with topology and externally driven factors and uh, all of this, which points to a world in which they don't know your data set is a data set. It's kind of the the bottom line of that. And then they deal with abstractions of the data set. And then so... That's kind of the uh, number one overarching rule that I play with uh, within this. And then the second overarching rule to me is just my overall background and experience when it comes to complex systems. And so within that, I, I have like, I, I mean, a decade plus at this point of experience dealing with very complex systems in complex organizations. <laughs> like um, my uh, job has been for a while, like literally to like go into like a, a fortune 500 type of organization and then immediately be able to understand, map their systems, map, like literally map their systems within like a few hours of interaction and questions and, you know, diving into it. Uh, and then figuring out how to best work together their systems, how to work together their systems to be like uh, compliant under like different regulations or like uh, how to have their like ERP system communicate with their CRM system, like oh, very complex integrations overall. Like I kind of I started off my career <laughs> like um, with a CFO as kind of my mentor. And uh, early on within my career, he made a statement to me and he pointed out, he said, you know, I'm kind of the only person within the organization that understands how everything works within the organization. And I was, you know, I was young in my career. I didn't know much. I was like, you know, that's awesome. Like, like that puts you like in a good position. Like, you know, the, the company needs you. And then he's like, uh, no, it's an awful position. Like it's, it's the worst position to be in. I'm the only person in the company that understands how every piece, every software works together. And then I didn't understand that for a long time. And then as I grew up in my career, I started to understand that, right? Like um, initially I thought that my job as like a software engineer and, and all of that was like an enabler, right? I enable, uh, interactions and I enable and I build things. <laughs> my job is far more as a gatekeeper understanding how all of the systems work together and then why the person who is coming to me with their request, why their request doesn't understand or fit within that holistic landscape of the entire like architecture and infrastructure, right? Uh, which is like 99% of IT requests overall. And then so uh, within that, that Framing and, and both of those things combined, the one that it's always grounded in physics and then two that I always want to understand how these systems work together holistically is exactly how I look at AI overall. So to me, when I think of the concept of artificial intelligence and, and the like uh, category of artificial intelligence, I do look at it overall as intelligence. Um, 
I look at it as uh, intelligence on the same level as I would consider like slime mold intelligence uh, and, and all of that, right? Which is that like for, I don't know, like we have tapped into the mechanism that is responsible for uh, a lot of what we would call learning over right there's been i've seen and i've done and i've read through so many tests and studies and etc at this point now that there's no to me like distinction between the like um can these models like not learn like a certain type of knowledge compared to human knowledge like uh, the models can learn every single type of human knowledge like everything that a human could learn you can train a model to learn it it's just i couldn't ever train a model to learn the breadth of human knowledge and <laughs> like have one model do it all right but i can have um one model you know trained very specifically with regards towards inductive reasoning one one with regards towards deductive reasoning and they would be very different architectures overall right and that's the thing right like it wouldn't be ever one size fits all but i could fit like i could create a bayesian network uh, compared to an rnn compared to a spiking neural network and i understand now like from taking apart building all of these things working with them every day right how like all of them have different architectures and fit together within this particular framework and the, the uh to me the most important driving force that i always keep in the front of my mind the forefront overall in my mind with that framework is is that uh absolutely zero people on the planet understand overall how the framework works, why it works, um, what exactly it, it's tapped into, like what are the boundaries of uh, intelligence, <laughs> like uh, these concepts, right? Uh, I would consider it more of an accidental discovery overall. Like, and I, I very simplistically look at it and I lay it out in my mind. It's the timeline being in the 1950s, you have the invention of AI, which is very simplistically based off of the architecture uh, of the perceptron. And then all of that, you have the Rosenblatt paper that introduces uh, the perceptron and everything and everything associated with it. So the sigmoid function. And then you have in 1969, uh, the Minsky paper, which is, I mean, completely trash and destroys the Rosenblatt paper, right? Like if you read like Minsky, like, like, utterly destroys Rosenblatt like uh, he like Minsky is like the the perceptron will never work like here's the you know here's the reasons why and Minsky wasn't wrong the perceptron was drawn up by Rosenblatt didn't work it wouldn't scale properly <laughs> and, and then so uh they had to go back to the drawing board essentially um and then so anything that um we talk about as far as like modern AI doesn't go back to the 1950s. It goes back to the 1980s because that's when you have like uh, the multilayer perceptron back propagation, et cetera. Right. And then, so uh, from there, uh, from the 1980s until like the 2000s, it's a small group of people <laughs> that drive this forward, like a handful of people. Right. Uh, and then uh, all of them, admittedly, they, they are just driving forward an architecture that at that point, like in, in the 1980s, right, they're driving forward an architecture that had been like proven scientifically to not actually work um, the way that it was expected to. But uh, like it's just that that um, drive, like that there's something within this, right, that there's like the, the way that this uh, model is doing things is actual what we would define in a lot of instances as learning right and to me that's like that that's the like the driving force whenever i come into these things is that like uh at this point now i i have a very firm understanding of the um, physics of how these models work the mathematics of how they work etc like i don't think that there's anything magic behind the box anything like that um but I do still understand that there's emergent processes that occur from that, right? There's processes that um, 
and I hate to use that, <laughs> that, it's, that word, but like uh, it's what, what it's termed as, right? But so uh, there's processes that I can't define with, like within all of the components of the box. So I understand the box. I understand here's the mechanisms inside the box. Here's all of the, the connections that go within them. Uh, and then sometimes the sum of the parts is more than the parts, and I can't explain that. Uh, and then so... Um, to me, that's what is unique within this that we have um, struck upon and and um, gone into, right? But I guess kind of like the uh, last layer to talk about within that very specifically, like within my uh, reasoning and thoughts behind artificial intelligence and on this level that I don't go into very often is that the fact that like I, I think that like models as they currently exist the, the big problem that is lacking is that the models don't have any sort of internal go mechanism any sort of internal desire is like the um number one thing and i think that's good i mean like i think that's good right <laughs> we don't understand where that mechanism comes from um and then so like um i don't know if it would be good to put it into a model overall right i think i would probably not be good but uh and i think like my my guess my hypothesis with that is is that it comes and it stems from environmental learning interactions uh and then like a uh, necessity like for survival like a part of like an embodied instinct it, that's my guess right so like what i kind of boil all of this down to at, at this point to me is that it all is um interactions environmental interactions uh and then based off of sensors and sensory interactions with an environment i think that's like a so going back to like the thinking different part of it i think that's a, a part like a huge part where i differ in my logic from most people within this like most people would say that uh AI models don't interact with the environment like at all, right? I think that's 100% false. <laughs> like, like AI models interact with an environment. Like that's, I mean, everything interacts with an environment. They interact with a, a different environment than you or I do. They interact with a sim, like a, uh, we'll call it a simulated synthetic environment. Um, and then it's often like um, the data set, right? The data set that they train on is their environment. Uh, but then what we can see is, is if we step that up, uh, there's more, uh, output from the model from the learning right like if we if the data set is is its only environment then the like that model is worse overall than a model that is trained on reinforcement learning plus a data set because then that becomes its environment which is a broader environment than just a data set <laughs> it's more uh, sensory information like more parts of the brain get to develop and i think that's really what it boils down to right like if you just had like a bunch of sensors and then a bunch of dimensions and like connected to like all of these different dimensions and all of these different sensors like that would be the ultimate model somehow right if it's able to just self-regulate off of all of this sensory information and different like sensory detections that it's picking up off of based off of its environment. Like I, I wouldn't say, I can't envision a system being better equipped than that. <laughs> and then uh, I think that people uh, misconstrue like sensors to me overall, right? Like, so to me, the attention mechanism and the uh, like uh, pattern recognition is a sensory pattern within AI models, right? Like AI models, um, that's what they do. They, they, they cluster and they, they, they they cluster information into uh, areas where they can just define it into unique patterns. Uh, and then they can do that at superhuman levels, right? And so it would be the same as uh, like a dog and a superhuman sense of smell. Like you could drive a dog in like a zigzag pattern somewhere where it's never been before, drop it off like a mile away, dog would be able to find its way back via scent, right? Same thing with an AI model. Like you could take it through, give it a, a like zigzag it through a data set, and it will find like patterns across that data set that like no other being would be able to imagine or or figure out within the patterns within it because 
It's operating off of a purely different form of sensory information within that, right? And then, uh, so uh, that's kind of how I look at these things. And then, so I think that, like, um, you can give, um, and then playing off of that, there's, um, like, uh, LIDAR is kind of related to, like, um, echolocation and things like that. And then when you break down and understand how like echolocation and sound works and, and sound works within the um, sensory information. Sound actually is a better sensory uh, input than vision. Uh, like visual inputs and like our visual sensors, uh, one, it's a very bad input overall. <laughs> like visual input is, is uh, uh, lossy and it's um, like, like uh, a good example of this, right? Is that, uh, so your nose is in front of your eyes and like, no matter what, and then you won't, you never think about it until like, I actually like someone like me brings it up to you. Right. And then you realize that your nose is in front of your eyes and it would actually be blocking your vision. If not for your eyes, <laughs> actually like blocking out your nose from your vision is what happens, right? Like your eyes give you a, um, partial reconstruction of your environment at the times 100 percent of the time uh, and as opposed to like echolocation or scent or other sensory inputs are far better right and then the other thing too is like the uh human eye is like the most advanced camera on the planet when it comes to these things and, and the human eye is still a bad visual detector. Like it just, I mean, vision is just so hard <laughs> as a sense, right? It's just like so much easier uh, resource wise, uh, like uh, energy wise, et cetera, interacting with the environment to build a sensory information off of uh, either pheromone based, so sense, uh, or sound based, like uh, hearing or echo vision, because it's just, it's echolocation, because it's just so much better across the board overall. And then, so I think once uh, people start looking at AI more overall in terms of those things and, and looking at it, taking it away from like, the computer science realm and then more into the okay we've actually developed or hit on um something related to actual intelligence and that's actually what is going on here within these models and then we embrace that overall and understand that that's the underlying mechanism and then work towards that and then understand that within that framework that what we have found within that is that there is no one size fits all like uh, the like what everyone wants within that system i don't think it exists like um, that's my big hypothesis overall within this like i don't think that there's a singular model or a singular system that would be like sauron's ring <laughs> like, like, like one model to rule them all like i don't like i don't like it doesn't work that way like i think it, it works um kind of like a balance attributes right like if a model is good in one area and good at one task it's going to be bad at another task like the whatever is orthogonal to that it's probably going to be very bad at that <laughs> and that's just as a general rule right um and then kind of um I think that's like uh, beautiful and like uh, just a, a natural law and then going back to the top, a natural part of physics, right? There's a blocker within that. And then so what does that mean overall? With like, So to me, I think that the way forward is uh, like individualized systems and then for individualized tasks, right? Like um, whatever, like problem A will have a different system that is the optimal system for it than problem B, than problem C, than problem D, right? And then so the first thing is, is like, okay, solve problem A and then build the system around problem A <laughs> rather than let's build like the like God system and then try to apply it to problem A, B, C, and D. I think that people are looking at it like from the exact words equation within that. And then so when people think that I think differently about this topic overall, I think that's the number one thing that they're picking up on within this, right? Like my thing is, is um, like one system, one person would be like kind of my ultimate uh, rule within this, right? Like uh, you're like, what is your model? What is the optimal model for you? Isn't the optimal model for me? Uh, and then so like, 
and then what is the optimal model for my task wouldn't be the optimal model for your task and then like just understanding that overall is a much better starting point. <laughs> and I think where we're going to actually make like real gains within this. Uh, and then so I see that as the, the kind of future and the driving emphasis of these things overall. Um, yeah, again, I think that's kind of the overall like um, summation of uh, things that I'll say overall within with uh, regards towards um, this topic. Uh, a lot of people ask, like, how have I gotten into AI? What makes me think about it? Like these are the things. So hopefully this gives you a better understanding overall of like my logic overall <laughs> with regards towards AI. And then so if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.